Great. So hello, everyone. My name is Noor Janbe, and today I'm going to be presenting about implantable brain chips, um, an assessment of brain implant technologies and the future of Neuralink in medicine. The next slide. So the outline of my project is going. I'm going to start about talking in about nano uh, science and nanotechnology, and then um, and the history of nanotechnology approaches and application, the development of brain chip, um, artificial brain chips, um, brain like devices, algorithms achievement, limitation, neuralink, and the ethical assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, the difference between nanoscience and nanotechnology, um, nanoscience is the fundamental study of structures, molecules, and atoms of the matter at the nanometer scale ranging from one to 100. It is the study of manipulation of structure at a sup supramolecular level. And um, nanoscience basically establishes the knowledge ground for nanotechnology, which is, uh, uh, the technology that employs nanoscience in the production, designing, and characterization of practical application and uh, such as devices. Um, so the history of um, nanotechnology in 1959, the Nobel Prize uh, laureate Richard Feynman introduced the theory of nanotechnology and in uh, 1974, the Japanese scientist who is uh, Norio defined the term of nanotechnology as the um, as um, as the nanotechnology mainly consists of processing of se uh, separation, consolidation, and deformation of material by one atom or one molecule. Next slide. There are two approaches of uh, manufacturing nanostructure. The top bottom approach, which is uh, breaking down of bulk structures to get nano sized lithography, and the bottom top approach, which is the buildup of nano, nano uh, structures from the bottom, including atom by atom or molecule by molecule. Uh, this is just a slide of uh, the approaches. Um, uh, the top, bottom, and bottom up. Next one. Um, uh, the 21st century announcement. Uh, in, in the recent year, nanotechnology has been developing in several other fields, including um, um, including bioengineering and computer sciences. So uh, there have been Two announcement uh, by, I think we skipped a slide. Did we? Yeah, the applications after this one. The application of nanotechnology has been used in uh, bioengineering and computer science um, with uh, like producing degree size computers from room size devices. Uh, to highly practical uh, movable devices such as laptops and uh, which way the, its way through to get to brain chips. Um, nanotechnology also allowed electrical engineering to design, to design electrical circuits at the nanoscale level. Um, furthermore, there has been, uh, nanotechnologies have been promoted to enhance the environment by generating cost-effective and efficient energy sources. And it's all, it also was used in nanopharmaceutical and what's, what the most significant achievement was in cancer therapeutics um, and which will have a like, great potential in that field in the future. Um, next slide. Next one. During the beginning of that no, the 21st century, 
um, interest in nanotechnology increased, which led to the announcement of President Bill Clinton, where he approved the funding of nanotechnology research. And three afters that President George W. Bush approved the law of Nanotechnology Research and Development Act. Um, um, competition. Uh, competition has witnessed significant development during the recent years, which include um, high-speed calculation and using big data sets. However, uh, with the limitation of Moore's law and a von Neumann structure uh, that proposed that the number of devices cannot increase without limit, and to overcome this uh, challenge, uh, brain-like chips were produced to mimic the process of information analyzing in the human brain as a suitable estimating of high accuracy and capacity. Um, given Moore's law, the number of devices, uh, uh, numbers of devices integrated on a single chip must meet its vertex. And to solve this problem, we need to find an efficient system to, to develop modern chips. Um, uh, since the human brain have high efficiency, large capacity and multiple task handling and many other and low power consumption, um, brain-like chips modif is the modified, <laughs> brain-like chips modified from the brain stru structure can be used in different setting and they are the hardware employing the brain structures and analysis. Um, brain-like chips are implanted on humans uh, brain biological tissue, along with brain-like computation that copies information from the mammal's brain and performs the use of parallel high-speed calculation and do memorizing as well. Um, based on a neuron, the neuron structure, brain-like chips will have the ability to overcome the limitation of von Neumann, Neumann and enhance the complexity and the speed of calculation, along with decreasing the power of consumption. Um, artificial Intelligent chips, there are four types, GPU, FPGE, ASIC, and brain-like chips, uh, which is basically, we're gonna talk about brain-like chips, which is mimic humans, particularly is copying the human brain structure. Um, what is used to manufacture brain chips? Uh, there are three devices used, um, SMOS, as uh, memory devices and artificial synapses. Uh, they all differentiate between their advantages and disadvantages. Um, as a, as a MOS is uh, application is True North by IBM, which is widely used and known. Um, memory devices is TNG chip and artificial synapses is CIG by MIT. Um, Although CMS is widely used in traditional chips, it's not suitable for brain-like structure because it's primarily constrained by manufacturer process and physical limitation. Uh, so basically artificial synapses will play an essential role in the future research as a newborn structure because if it's low power of consumption and um, basically low, low power of consumption. Next slide. Um, brain-like computation and brain-like chips design are meaningless without the bionic foundation. Um, yeah. Next slide. Um, the algorithm used in brain chips is uh, spiking neural networks, uh, which is the third generation of uh, algorithm in artificial networks. Um, is also, uh, it is also incorporate the concept of time into their operating model. Um, neurons do not fire at each propagating uh, circle. They work only when membrane potential reaches a specific value. Next slide. Um, there are two learning methods that are used by the um, SNN, uh, which is uh, the uh, Habian learning method and the STDP learning method. And uh, basically the Habian learning is based on Habian rule, which says when an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and, uh, and repeatedly or uh, is taken apart in firing it, the connection between them will be strengthened. Um, STDP is another method that's uh, 
derived from the Havian learning uh, rule, and it stands for spike timing dependent plasticity. Um, uh, it is actively dependent development of neuron system. It also describes the connection strength between neurons in the brain, and it makes Havian learning rule accurate, accurate as 10 of milliseconds. Next one. Uh, the achievement of, of brain-like chips is True North by IBM, which is a single chip that has 4,000 cores on it. Uh, the threshold voltage is needed 0.53 volt, and each core has two, uh, 256 digital spiking neurons and 65 kilobyte SRN. The other up achievement is, uh, next slide, Luhi by Ento. Uh, that is a 16 millimeter square ship that has 128 uh, neuromorphic cores and three, uh, that's it. Uh, True North is used in many different circumstances, which is it's more uh, user-friendly. Next slide. There are many difficulties that uh, are existing problems through the past decades of developing um, human brain chips. We skipped one, we skipped the slide. Uh, such as the basic structure of neuron is not enough for mimicking human brain. Um, the scale of calculation is small, the speed and accuracy are low. Neuralink by Elon Musk. Um, everyone knows Elon Musk. He's known as high profile companies like Tesla, SpaceX. And he recently started uh, one of uh, like the achievement of symbiosis between the human brain and the artificial intelligence or the goal to achieve the symbiosis. Um, um, it's developing a device, basically Neuralink is developing a device that would be embedded in person brains where it would record brain activity and potential stimulate it. Um, the, they hope like that this tech will potentially, will have potential near term medical application. Um, Neuralink was just founded under the radar in 2016, and it was like came out to public like, on 2017. And in 2019, uh, Elon Musk along with his uh, executive team showed a live stream presentation about the, the Neuralink chip. Uh, next slide. Basically Neuralink, uh, has two bits of equipment. The first one is the chip that will be implanted um, in the person's skull behind the ear. And this chip has electrodes that will, um, will be fanning out in the brain, which are in like, which are very, very tiny uh, wires that is roughly 20 times thinner than a human hair. Um, the wires are equipped with more than a thousand electrodes, which are able to monitor the brain activity and theoretically uh, still a theory, but and electrically uh, it will stimulate the brain. Um, the data transmitted uh, wirelessly via the chip to computers where it can be studied by research and analyzed. Um, the second bit of equipment will be a robot that could ultimately implant the chip. Um, the work the robot would work using a stiff needle to pinch the flexible wires um, from the neural link chip into person's brain. And they say it's a bit like sewing machine. I don't know, I'm not sure that, right? But they claim to say that in the future, the robot will be able to implant the uh, chip um, as fast, and as easy and fast as a LASIK eye surgery. Um, in, so the Neuralink started experiments on, uh, on pigs, on animals, basically. In 2020, Neuralink showed off one of its ships embedded in a pig named Gertrude. Uh, she had been living, the pig had been living with the chip embedded in her skull for two months. Uh, the demonstration showed that chip was able to accurately predict the positioning of uh, her, like the pig's limb when she was walking on a treadmill, as well as it was able to recall, record neural activity when the pig uh, snuffed about for food, they claimed that the wireless relay from the neural link ship could potentially um, have a good impact on the welfare of the animal. In 2021, um, a monkey named Pager uh, uh, 
the company Neuralink showed the monkey named Pidger playing video games with his mind. Um, the, the game was like a reward game. Uh, the monkey played the games using a joystick that was disconnected from the game console, meaning he was controlling uh, the game using his brain, uh, his brain signals as his arm moved. Um, many say that um, Elon Musk did not just invent these out of nowhere and he's just continuing the, um, the work of others. Um, no, we're still way behind, sir. Professor? Mm -hmm. Previous slide. Uh, previous one, too. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, future work of Neuralink. Um, they're hoping uh, to, to implant, start testing and implanting these chips on human in 2022, but they're waiting for uh, the approval. Um, it is not, um, they will have like when, if they could implant it in the human brain, they will have to wait a long time before they start analyzing and studying it because it has to be implanted for a long time to be able to um, test all of the things that they want it like to test it. Um, and they, they say that improved Neuralink will help in the uh, treating Parkinson's disorder and uh, helping with Alzheimer's disorder, um, refreshing memories and keeping the memories. Um, another application of that, it will be when a human have a robotic arm and like he is, they will, Neuralink will help these people control the arm uh, and uh, with their minds. Um, they say that they're, they're planning to have a first appli commercial application to help the uh, quadriplegic people who are partially or for paralyzed, uh, paralysis in all four limbs. Um, The um, more about Neuralink future, uh, they are, he often links, he, Elon Musk often links the company with his fears about artificial intelligence. And he said, um, um, he thinks humanity will be able to achieve symbiosis with artificial intelligence using technology developed by Neuralink. Um, uh, we will, he say, we will not be able to be smarter than a digital supercomputer. So therefore, if we cannot beat them, join them. The ethical assessment of implantable brain chips. Um, there are many arguments against the implantable brain chips. Fears of tampering with human nature is widespread. Um, there is a theme of the nature is good and technology is evil. Something that the power to recreate oneself is overreaching hubris and it's the work of God and re-engineering humanity can only re result in disaster. Um, to attempt to alter the function of the brain uh, for purposes, purposes of creating a superior human being can be described as using God's, God's power. Um, as Ellen once said in his video of Road to Hell Paved with Good Intentions, we could have a plug of British people in crowds. They are awful. And I can imagine a perfectly uh, pestiferous ma mass of million of saints. Just be sure that the vast variety of human beings is maintained. Do not breed us down to few excellent types. We never know how circumstances could change. And basically the circumstance, circumstances will need of human to be or act like something different for each time. Um, there are issues of safety, uh, manufacturing and scientific responsibilities, um, anxieties of the psychological impact of en enhancing human nature. Um, they will be, it might result in a gap between the poor and the rich because it will not be available for everyone. Um, and the, the one of the greatest fear is that most frightening application of this technology is the grave possibility that it would facilitate total control of humanities, which may lead to singularity. Um, and moving to the 
last slide. This is uh, the Dada holding two of his brain chips. In 1970, he said, um, we cannot avoid, avoid technology. Uh, technology is going to be ahead in spite of ethics, in spite of personal beliefs, and in spite of everything. And yeah, that's it. Thank you all for listening. Okay. So, any questions? So, um, did the pig also play video games? I think so. I, I, I don't remember all the details. But I think I have that video of the the monkey playing the video game, but I all see. I saw the pig. Like his neural activity, basically. Right. Uh, Ryan, you had a question. Uh, no, I was just uh, saying good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting area. That's that's for sure. And. Um, Anyway, thank you for telling us about it. Um, so, uh, Ryan, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay. I'll just um, get everything going here on my side. Okay. All right. Um, are you seeing my slides? Yes, we are. Perfect. <clears throat> Ready. Um, okay. Sweet. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being at today's seminar, the, the few of you that are here. Uh, my name is Ryan, for those of you who don't know me, and today I will be presenting on the topic of cryonics and its role on Earth and in interstellar travel. So I'm just going to kind of set the stage uh, for cryonics on Earth. So a, a man lays in his hospital bed. His body is old and decaying, but it's served him well for many years. His mind and spirit, however, are still youthful and craving adventure, but his heart beats on borrowed time. His ECG reading flatlines and a physician declares the time of death. Not a second after, a team of highly efficient healthcare professionals artificially resume his breathing and blood circulation to stabilize his body and preserve his brain and other large organs. His body is quickly transported to a nearby cryonics facility where his body undergoes further stabilization. His body is now prepped and he is placed in a vacuum sealed liquid nitrogen cooled chamber where his body may be preserved for theoretically thousands of years. Patiently, he waits for a day which may or may not be come where he's awoken from his frozen slumber and born anew. For this presentation, I'm going to cover a brief description, of the science of cryonics, followed by a brief history, some future applications of cryonics on Earth and in space, and lastly, ethical dilemmas associated with the science. Now, what is cryonics? Cryonics is a field of science uh, often associated with feelings of speculation and fictitious belief. However, the technological singularity may allow us to transcend biology and preserve human life long after individuals have surpassed their biological expiration date. Cryonics is the practice of deep freezing individuals who have been declared legally deceased with hopes of resurrecting their consciousness in the future. It is typically done using liquid nitrogen to expose bodies to temperatures below negative 196 degrees Celsius and it brings all processes such as metabolism, aging, and deterioration of the body to a standstill. More recently, talks of the potential practice of cryonics with living individuals and tissues has been gaining interest. So a brief history of cryonics. Uh, the science actually dates back over five decades. Dr. James Bedford was actually the first human to be cryopreserved. 
1967, at the age of 73, he unfortunately passed from an aggressive form of kidney cancer that had spread to his lungs. Uh, but his dying wish was, the, was for the cryo preservation of his body. Uh, after he was pronounced legally dead due to cardiorespiratory arrest, his body was transferred to the care of doctors who were working for the Cryonics Society of California, and his body underwent preparation for cryopreservation. However, due to the early and often primitive nature of cryonics back in the early 70s, it is highly unlikely that the methods used to preserve his body were actually successful in uh, preventing eventual decay. However, to this day, his body remains cryopreserved in sub-zero temperatures in the care of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, which is a company that's centered around cryonic research and technology. Although the idea that a human body has been preserved for over five decades is truly uh, riveting and fascinating, it prompts the question, can these bodies be reanimated? Now, there are a few examples in history where there's been reanimation from a cryo-like state uh, and one case is the Anna Bagham home incident. Uh, she is known for having the lowest survived body temperature ever recorded. Uh, back in 1999, she was skiing in Norway when she lost control of her skis and was actually trapped head first under a layer of ice from a frozen stream. She remained conscious for 40 minutes by breathing in an air pocket that was under the ice. Uh, however, after 80 minutes, she actually went, or uh, sorry, after 40 minutes, she went unconscious uh, due to hypothermic circulatory arrest, and not until after 80 minutes she, um, was she pulled from the icy waters. Uh, when she was rescued, she was not breathing, her blood was not circulating, and she had a body temperature of 13.7 degrees Celsius. She went without a heartbeat for over two hours and was eventually hooked up to a ventilator to restore breathing. Her blood was actually circulated outside of her body to warm it up through a cardiopulmonary bypass machine. And after nine hours of meticulous work by hospital staff, she began to show signs of life, although she was paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, shockingly enough, she actually made a full recovery with only minor symptoms of nerve damage and her hands and feet. Um, a physician from the hospital in Norway commented on this incident saying one thought as to why she was able to survive uh, was that her metabolism had slowed to a point at which the tissues in her body required almost no oxygen. The frigid temperatures from the uh, frozen water were thought to induce a uh, reduction in metabolic rate, which actually slowed down to one-tenth of its baseline, meaning the cells in her body required minimal oxygen to main, uh, remain viable. Additionally, her brain had become so cold before her heart stopped beating that the brain cells remained undamaged and essentially they were preserved in a cryo-like state. Now, if metabolic functions can be slowed down naturally for short durations and then reactivated, uh, who's to say that this process can't be extended for longer durations in a controlled setting that's been meticulously designed? Uh, the theory behind cryonics, uh, essentially the process takes place in the following steps. A patient is pronounced legally dead by a medical professional and an emergency cryonics team will stabilize the body uh, by artificially restoring blood circulation and breathing and they will inject a anticoagulant uh, heparin to prevent blood clotting. And then during the transport to the facility, the body will be cooled in an ice bath. And once at the facility, all the water inside the cells and tissues will be replaced with a glycerol-based chemical solution uh, called the cryoprotectant. Um, this is done because the average human body is composed of 60% water, meaning it's uh, a prevalent compound in human cells, tissues, and organs and it must be removed before cryopreservation or the water in the cells and tissues will actually expand as, the, uh, as there's a state change, which could potentially crack and shatter uh, the cells, which would do significant damage. Uh, the body is placed on dry ice until it cools to a negative 130 degrees Celsius, which is a process known as vitrification. Uh, essentially, it is cooling of the body without the formation of ice. The body is then placed upside down in a vacuum insulated metal chamber that's filled with liquid nitrogen, which is used to cool the body to its final temperature of negative 196 degrees Celsius. Now the patient can remain in the state until the reanimation process occurs, which is currently impossible with today's cryonics technology. There's a lot of speculation that exists regarding if the significant damage that's done to cells during cryopreservation can be repaired. Uh, upon the reanimation process, 
And many experts claim that nanotechnology is the ultimate solution for cell repair at the molecular level. Uh, however, these depictions of nanotechnology seem quite far off from what we have in, uh, in today's world. And that means that either nanotechnology must undergo uh, significant and exponential expansion to carry out the purposes of the science, or another solution will have to be developed for repairing cryopreservation preservation induced cell damage. Now there's a few applications of, of cryonics on Earth. Uh, one is being the cryopreservation of patients with terminal diagnosis, such as cancer, liver disease, or pulmonary disease. Um, individuals who are told by physicians that they have a terminal condition face a harsh, raw reality. And sadly, many of the maladies that actually plague modern medicine are untreatable. However, the question is not if humanity will find a cure, it's when. And hypothetically, patients could undergo cryopreservation before their death occurs, and they could remain in a suspended state until that cure for the disease is found. Then the patient could be reanimated and the cure could be administered. Now, you can apply this same principle of cryopreservation to individuals who are waiting on organ transplant lists. The Health Resources and Service Administration website states that over 106,000 people are registered on the National Organ Transplant Waiting List. And of these people, 17 will die each day waiting for an organ transplant. So cryopreservation may allow individuals to slow their deteriorating condition until it almost stands still, meaning modern medicine could extend the duration a patient can wait for an organ transplant. Ideally, a, patient, uh, a patient's wait time for an organ will be factored in with their current health condition. And if a physician suspects that they may pass before that organ becomes available, they will recommend cryopreservation. Then if the patient opts for that process, they will remain in a suspended state until the required organ becomes available. Then they'll be reanimated uh, once it becomes available and they will undergo the transplantation. Now on the topic of transplantation, uh, another application is the cryopreservation of organs from donors to extend the period in which transplantation may be viable. Uh, a statistic from 2017 states that 60% of heart and lung organs are actually discarded each year as they lose their viability after being cut off from the blood supply longer than four hours. Uh, an estimate from that same study actually suggests that even if 50% of these discarded organs could be still transplanted, the waiting list could be eliminated within two to three years. Uh, in 2017, actually scientists were successful in cryogenically freezing and rewarming select parts of heart tissue without cracking or shattering the organ. And they were able to induce cryopreservation by infusing the tissues with uh, cryoprotectant solution and magnetic nanoparticles, which were zinc oxide. Now the organ was uh, put into a vitrified state and it was warmed by placing this heart in a induction coil, which would generate a magnetic field and actually cause the, uh, the nanoparticles to vibrate, which would generate heat and slowly warm up the organ. Now, if this process can be scaled to larger organs, such as the kidneys and the lungs, uh, cryopreservation may be a critical step in organ transplantation. Uh, cryonics in space. So cryosleep is a sub area of cryonics, which is more interested in the cryopreservation of living beings for space travel. Now it's a concept that's often portrayed in fictional books, movies, and TV shows. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen Christopher Nolan's science fiction film, Interstellar, where the long nap is a spinoff of a cryo uh, sleep pod that allows the crew of a spacecraft to sleep for extended periods of time while traveling to distant planets. Essentially, uh, this allows the crew to minimize supply consumption, slow the aging process uh, during extended periods of space travel. Now, in a world of nonfiction, cryosleep may push the boundaries of space travel, which would allow astronauts to endeavor on expeditions to distant uh, planets and galaxies. Uh, recently, in a partnership with Spacework Enterprises, NASA has actually begun developments on a cryosleep chamber, which would allow astronauts to sleep for up to two weeks at a time while traveling in space. The chamber-induced hibernation would bring metabolic functions to a reduced rate by lowering the body temperature uh, to a point in which they're almost hypothermic. This would mean that nutritional and oxygen needs are minimized and exposure to harmful cosmic radiation could actually be avoided. By minimizing the crew's needs on board, uh, the system mass, power, and volume is reduced, which actually minimizes the risk associated with long duration space travel. Uh, the prospect of human expeditions to other planets is actually 
uh, much closer to becoming a reality than we may think just because of cryonics. A trip to Mars, which typically takes between 200 and 300 days, depending on the orbital distance between Earth and Mars, has much greater feasibility if astronauts are in cryostasis for 95% of the trip. Ethical dilemmas. So a considerable challenge, um, it remains a long-standing problem for the implementation of cryonox is the ethics and legislation that's associated with the topic. So anyone with funding can actually have themselves cryopreserved, but the conditional requirement is that an individual undergoing cryopreservation must first be declared legally dead by a medical professional. Now, this single piece of legislation presents a substantial barrier to the further development of technology in cryonics, and it exists for good reason. Uh, inducing cryostasis essentially requires the cessation of cardiac functions, meaning patients would, in technical terms, be killed during a cryopres uh, cryopreservation process, um, and medical professionals purposely killing patients for long-term preservation poses both ethical and moral dilemmas that must be discussed in higher court settings in the presence of multiple uh, indifferent representatives. Um, and again, it, it actually goes against one of the pillars of medicine, um, which, is, which is do no harm. Now, a case can be made for um, cryonox after death um, by kind of evaluating the traditional two options that exist for individuals who have passed on. Burial and cremation are essentially the two final nails in the coffin after death. So opting for cryopreservation is a rational choice if survival is still possible, no matter how small a percentage. In any case, new legislation regar uh, regarding the science is essential um, as it becomes more integrated in our society. Um, here are my references. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Maybe you learned something. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer them as best as I can. Okay, maybe you could unshare. Yes, yeah, so we can have some discussion. So, you know, this is a kind of unique topic, just that the limits of what we can talk about in a course like this, many of you would be aware that here at the University of Alberta, there's a strong research group on cryobiology. And what they're studying really doesn't overlap with uh, cryonics. They're freezing single cells and small things like heart valves and corneas and so on. Um, and as Ryan has, has quite accurately pointed out, we don't really know that cryonics will work. Now, it does work at a very primitive level. You can freeze worms and bring them back to life. And you can freeze a rabbit kidney and 30% of the time get the rabbit kidney to function. But there's very poor understanding of why 70% <laughs> the rabbit kidneys that you freeze don't work and 30% do. And you can imagine that if your consciousness was uh, brought back without fixing the other things, that it'd be worse than being dead because using techniques of the present day, it's not just microscopic uh, injury, but actually like rents or fractures in the skin surface as the body is frozen, that would be amazingly painful and bleed and, <laughs> and so on. But still, it's obviously something worth trying and it's just a kind of the edge of legitimate science versus, um, pseudoscience. Pseudoscience would be if it, there was no chance of it working at all or if the chance was very low. And, and it's kind of at an intermediate point. Yeah, so there was a question. I think one of the students had a question. I don't want to do all the <laughs> talking here. Did this subject surprise you or did you all already know everything about this? Yeah, let's have some reaction. Uh, <laughs> so.
So Pre says, yeah, let me look at the chat here. Very interesting topic. Medium knowledge, yes, okay. All right. Okay, well, um, I think we could move on. Uh, and so, Pre, would you like to go next? Hi, yeah, of course. I can do that. Um, it's just my laptop is not really doing well today so um i got kicked out of the meeting like once already so like if that happens i'll just quickly come back so i apologize okay. yeah um, <laughs> so i have your presentation here Let's yeah. see. i'll just uh say like i don't know like next slide at the yeah, I'm. I may let. Let me just go back and re. Yeah, I'm. I'm not immediate. I. I saw it here for sharing the four. Let me just. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back to my mail and bring it up to the top of the queue here. Just a second. Sorry, this is so inconvenient, but I just. I don't know what's happening with my laptop to be honest. With. Oh, let's see here. Slide show. Okay. All right. Let me go back now to Zoom and see if I can see it there. There it is. Okay, cool. All right. And let's see, how do I get it? Slideshow. There we go. Okay. So start from beginning. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Pri, and today I'm just going to present you a couple of ideas and just a design that may be the end of the um, Alzheimer's. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Uh, so we're just going to walk through the disease together and just identify the causation of its harms and just explore a way to turn our ideas into reality. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, to have it more organized, I'm just going to stick with a diagram with this one that we can see right now. So um, if Alzheimer's disease is what we have identified as our like quote unquote problem, we should explore a little deeper just to define a more detailed problem just because what causes or leads to Alzheimer's is technically what we're trying to come up with a design for, right? Um, so just like, the, um, just like the experience that we had in Shana's online session, when we just came up with a hypothetical design that could be a more sustainable and improved internet company, in being innovative in medicine, although facing more limitations is just more likely in healthcare related issues, we should still be wild with our ideas and just never restrict ourselves to the research that has been done already. So let's just be creative while we also look back and see how much we must compromise, how much we have, um, how many, what kind of risks we have, and just identify the drawbacks. Um, now, next. So in the background, I'm just going to, uh, next one. And one more, perfect. Uh, in the background, I'm just going to define the disease, uh, which is just a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory, 
and just thinking skills and it eventually um, takes the ability to do the easiest tasks away. Um, it was discovered by Dr. Alois Alzheimer um, after examination of a person who just died due to an unknown disease. Uh, the main observed features included abnormal clumps that are now called as uh, aneroid plaques and um, as well as just like tangled uh, bundlers of fiber that are now known as neurofibrillary tangles. Like, um, there are many factors uh, that lead to Alzheimer's uh, that I assume many of us have at least heard of. Uh, first of all, is just a general health condition such as uh, history of heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and etc. Um, they just like increase the likelihood of some person getting Alzheimer's and honestly, many other diseases, it's not just Alzheimer's. Um, moving on to the environmental factors, as we know, pollution uh, play an important role in humans and just in general, our planet health, uh, which I will come back to uh, these environmental factors later throughout the presentation, but I will mainly focus on genetic factors. Slide, please. Um, uh, so there are two types of genes that are defined to cause diseases. Uh, one of them is the deterministic genes that will definitely make a person sick. And there's also some risk, gene, risk genes uh, that will only increase the chances of the person develop um, the disease. Um, slide. Um, so uh, according to research, uh, two risk genes uh, have been identified that lead to Alzheimer's. First one is APOE gene. That is an autosomal dominant gene uh, we all receive. There are just many variants of uh, this particular gene, such as APOE E2 and APOE E3 that are not considered to be risk genes. Um, occurrence of particular mutations will make APOE E4 variant that is uh, known to be a risk gene. It's involved in producing beta uh, amyloid and later on uh, the production of plaques that are known to be one of the main factors in Alzheimer's disease. The next gene is called MAPT. This gene produces uh, proteins called tau proteins. These proteins are present in uh, our um, cerebral uh, spinal fluid. Uh, they are involved in neural uh, fibrillary tangles production. Uh, and some certain mutations lead to this uh, protein detaching from marker tubules and it sticks to other top proteins to form a tangles, with, which technically disrupts our neurotransmitters. Slide, please. Mm. Thank you. Um, and just one, one previous one. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, it's the previous one. And then again, one before. Okay. Um, there's, there's one before, and then just do um, Perfect. Right here. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so there are two ways to discover whether uh, it's uh, one next to this one. It's just testing, the one with testing. I'm so sorry. So, test after. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, so, um, there are two ways to discover whether we have a copy of these risk genes or not. Uh, first of all, taking a genetic test will confirm an individual's genotype, and it's just pretty reliable. Uh, there is an old fashioned type of genetic testing which uh, will take longer to give us the result back. Um, and with the help of technology, that everything is just easier. We can, with the help of machine learning, we can just do uh, another type of genetic testing um, that's so much easier and so much quicker. And then furthermore, since proteins usually, usually appear in the bloodstream, even with a simple blood test, um, we can just like observe the top proteins or beta amyloid, um, and then you can just like confirm the mm, carriage of risk genes. Although it's known that if top proteins are found in the bloodstream, the person is at a higher, um, like relatively higher risk than other patients. Now, slide, please. Uh, back to our diagram, we have identified that the issue is plaques produced by beta amyloids and tangles produced by top proteins. 
Um, or from another approach, we can say that lacking the substance in our brain that's responsible for us learning, thinking, and taking actions uh, in order to just doing our daily tasks is another um, uh, way of just looking at it and ident identifying our issues. Um, now let's see what we can do. So next, it's one before this slide. Perfect. And as we explore possible ways uh, to just reduce the chances of getting Alzheimer's uh, after realizing that we are in fact lacking something to have a better life, we must just think about the exact steps that's needed to be taken in order to fix introduce issues. Next slide. Um, if the plaque and tangles are removed from our nervous system, the problem is considered to be solved. Now, in order to get rid of these plaques and tangles, we must inhibit protein production, and for that, uh, we must either prevent mutation or just silence the genes that are um, mutated. So since most mutations are spontaneous, and it's just relatively harder to prevent spontaneous mutations, just um, silencing target genes uh, is just our way to go. Um, for example, we can have like a protein inhibitory RNA vaccine that can be just the answer to all of our needs. Or from another approach, if the amount of growth factors that are responsible for already existing norms increases, or if we can just somehow inject such factors to our um, some brain regions, the problem is once again considered to be solved. Or from another approach, if we just learn better with the help of for example, virtual reality, the problem is once again considered to be solved. Um, slide three. Um, thank you. Um, it's a one before this one. Thank you. Uh, so as I bet many of you know, um, RNA vaccines are just bio-designed RNAs that enter our cells and have various functionalities depending on the type of RNA present, um, that's like present in the vaccine. Uh, for example, with like Pfizer vaccines that are just mRNA vaccines uh, and they meant to produce a specific protein in order to increase their immunity against coronavirus. Um, RNA vaccines have many advantages over the traditional types of vaccines. Uh, for example, it's just um, they're non-infectious form of vaccine, so it's so much safer. And then uh, humans just showed a better and more efficient immune system response. And then the design um, is just so much easier and so much quicker, um, like not easier, but like the second that you get the hang of it, it's so much easier to design. As the technology also expands, the cost also decreases. And since there's just less chemicals used in it, it's just more environmentally friendly, which just going back to the environmental factors that also cause so many diseases. Now, slide again. Um, so overall, RNA vaccines are much more sustainable and sustainability in medicine matters according to principles of ethics in medicine. It's just important to pay attention to different aspects of a study. There may be a single good outcome within a study, but there may also be many harmful outcomes that humans tend to pay less of an attention to. Um, slide again. Um, so according to our diagram, now we have explored uh, so much and it's time to probably take action towards designing what will most likely be the end of all that is the slide again. Um, that's why that, like, I'm introducing our first design, which is the RNA uh, vaccine. And then we can just go to the next slide again. Um, as I previously mentioned, RNA molecules are uh, very diverse, so therefore, uh, there's a variety of functions defined for different RNAs in our body. Uh, SI RNAs, for example, are just small interfering RNAs that act in inhibiting protein and production by silencing the target gene. Instead of me explaining it, we can just watch a video. It's five minutes. It's kind of long, but it uh, perfectly ex explains like how it works in the cell. We can watch it or we can skip it. I don't know. It's in the next slide. It's kind of long. It's five minutes. Um, but it really helped me understand how it works. So if we have the time, we can maybe watch a little bit of it. So are you hearing it? Um, 
No. No. Okay. So um, what I need to do is to share the sound just a second here. Scientists have been making rapid progress in understanding RNA interference, or RNAi. Many organisms use RNAi to control genes, and it can also be used as a tool in the laboratory, and in the future, perhaps, as a therapy. This animation will introduce you to the principles of RNAi involving two important types of RNA molecule, small interfering RNAs and microRNAs. Eukaryotic cells have many sophisticated ways of controlling gene expression. In the complex environment of a cell, these mechanisms need to be precisely targeted. There's a group of mechanisms that use small RNA molecules to direct gene silencing. This is called RNAi. Inside the nucleus, most genes that encode proteins are transcribed by RNA polymerase II. The primary RNA transcript is processed by splicing and forms a mature messenger RNA, sometimes called mRNA. The messenger RNA is then exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Here, ribosomes catalyze translation of the messenger RNA to form polypeptide chains that fold into proteins. But this is also where some small RNA molecules can have their silencing effects. There are several types of regulatory small RNA. Small interfering RNAs, known as siRNAs, are derived from longer double-stranded RNAs that are either produced in the cell itself or are delivered into cells experimentally. The introduction of siRNAs, or double-stranded RNA, is widely used to manipulate gene expression. MicroRNAs are another type of small RNA. Most microRNAs come from RNAs that are transcribed in the nucleus, which then fold and are processed before being exported into the cytoplasm as double-stranded precursor microRNAs. The double-stranded precursors of micro uh, The video introduces two types of RNA, so the one that I was talking about is that type of thing. So I think we can just like go to the next slide. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, let me see. Second idea. <laughs> yeah. Now our second idea just explores the possibility, the possibility to reverse the progression of neurological disorders with gene therapy. With a gene therapy approach, we can release specific proteins into target uh, damaged brain regions and patients suffering from Alzheimer's. There are proteins that are in charge of the survival of already existing ones, and those proteins uh, are supposed to also promote growth within uh, brain cells. With gene therapy, we can offer an injection of mentioned protein complexes to damaged brain regions to promote growth while also restoring um, the surroundings. Like, um, and uh, moreover, in virtual reality space, uh, we may potentially be also able to uh, influence learning and treat memory loss in Alzheimer's. Like, I remember that in Shauna's session, we were talking about how like, um, I'm not sure if there was a study that was done or we were just talking about, um, like it was just an idea 
of like cows that were like actually in a very bad environment, but with virtual reality, let's say we can like virtually expose them to like a better, much better environment. And they, and they were just like, the, the milks were perfect and they were re reproducing perfectly. Uh, so I don't know, I just thought maybe this can also be something we can just like trick our brain, be like, you can learn. Um, um, slide. Uh, during this presentation, uh, we explored Alzheimer's disease and innovative treatments that will cure uh, and counteract disease progression. This is really important since such disease represents a worldwide challenge uh, affecting our global economy and the rise of healthcare costs. They also negatively impact uh, of the life quality. Therefore, uh, promoting effective preventing measures would be needed to reduce the worsening of conditions in clinical interventions. All mentioned ideas are um, just um, an innovation in medicine. They can prevent many diseases, including Alzheimer's, by making an uh, RNA I vaccine, for example, that targets A, C, O, E, B4, and MACC genes. Uh, there will be no more beta amyloid or top protein production. Therefore, there will be no more interruption in our nerve system in our nervous system regarding plaques and tangles. In order to make them even more environmentally friendly and ethical, we can also make vaccines like biological tablets that people can take just like any other pill instead of carrying them in glass vials that um, that's just like what we do right now. Uh, this will itself reduce the pollution and less of disease caused by pollution. It improves the overall life standards and it's the next step towards technological civilization. Slide, please. Uh, now, according to our beloved diagram, uh, we must now look back to see how much we have compromised or what are the drawbacks of such technology developments in, uh, like, in like vaccine industry in, or is there any other drawbacks in like other ideas that I mentioned? Uh, next slide. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, next thing. So there are two immediate drawbacks to the vaccine technology. Since its target, um, a specific encoded gene, it's also possible for the vaccine to target another gene that's very similarly encoded to the actual target gene. This will increase the chances of um, like mutations. Uh, but the good news is that our body has many processes that are responsible to check for mutations. And even if there is a mutation, they may be neutral. Chances are still not exactly zero, but maybe close to zero. And as previously mentioned, allergic reactions are not likely, but not zero and not, um, and the, like the severely of allergic reactions are not also common. Uh, about injecting growth, uh, promoting proteins, the size of the injected proteins is relatively large according to studies. Uh, therefore, the um, endocytosis to the cell may be difficult, in which a virus can also be designed to, ca to cause like a very specific mutation in our plasma membrane to let the protein in, which itself again could be risky, but there can be a clearness. And about virtual reality, a possible issue could be um, sometimes the positive steps uh, that like creatures take uh, with the help of virtual reality is only just valid while they have the glasses on and the results may not be permanent. Um, so we can just always trick our brain. Um, and next slide. And again, next slide. Um, so a, a possible solution is just to try to do as many experiments that's just humanly impossible to make sure the risks are minimized for protein, uh, for, for, uh, for patients uh, because of the protein-based uh, vaccines or the rest of the ideas. Experiments are done on um, just a live organism uh, like mice, uh, but one thing to think about uh, is uh, that is it really ethical? Uh, in order to do the best we can um, to provide the best, most ethical, and most effective technology for healthcare related concerns, scientists, com companies, and providers must pay attention to many different aspects of an invention while it's still an idea. Therefore, uh, with the help of machine learning, we can minimize the possible risks and negative impacts with the help of algorithms and logic and programming instead of actually experimenting um, on 
alive organisms and not, um, which is not very ethical and it's also time sensitive. Like, So um, to end this presentation uh, with a discussion, uh, we learned, um, like in our class, we learned that, that singularity is very much in it and suggested designs are all the next step towards reaching singularity, but is this considered to be an advantage or not? Um, that's one thing that I couldn't really figure out myself, depends on what perspective you're kind of just like having, but, yeah, if anyone wants to answer. Okay. Um, any questions? Uh, Ryan and Ms. Bach. Oh, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say that it was just um, really well done and I like um, the concepts that you explored. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, good cool. job. Okay. Uh, Ryan, was there something you wanted to say or Noor? Uh, no, I was just gonna say, yeah, it was, it was really interesting, really well done and uh, kind of an approach to um, Alzheimer's that I've never really seen or heard of before. So I thought that was really, really interesting. Great. Okay. So the last presentation is by Ariha. And are you ready to share your slides? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Very yeah. good. I will right. get that there. And can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thanks for um, coming and uh, viewing my presentation, everyone. So yeah, I'm gonna be going over medical issues that are faced by female astronauts and then how AI and technology can be implemented to combat these medical issues. So here's a little outline of what I'll be going over today. So first I'll be giving a bit of historical context regarding women's health and the relationship women's health has with spaceflight. Specifically, I'll touch on the lack of research regarding women's health and spaceflight and the knowledge gap that has resulted because of this lack of research. So secondly, I'll be going over specific medical issues that are faced by women during spaceflight due to anatomical differences between uh, male astronauts and female astronauts. Some female astronaut body systems are put at increased medical risks. So I'll be giving an overview about what some of these increased medical risks are. Thirdly, I'm going to look at how AI and technology can potentially be applied and implemented to these issues in the future to reduce these risks that are faced by astronauts when completing spaceflight. So uh, first, why worry about women's health in space? So given that I think Personally, it's very critical to investigate like how sex on impacts human spaceflight in order to ensure the safety of all astronauts. Though spaceflight is important for like research and exploration, I think one of the utmost like primary concerns is the safety of the astronauts that take part in safe flight in spaceflight. So then given that women account for around 11% of all astronauts, there is a significant data gap that must be addressed when developing space technology for mixed crew space missions in the future. So why worry about women's health in space? Additionally, women are becoming more and more involved in spaceflight, which is really great. So NASA, as well as the Canadian Space Agency and other space organizations have voiced intentions to have both women and men equally represented on future trips to Mars and to the moon. So as well as in commercial spaceflight as well. So therefore, as a result, um, research into female health in space, as well as the development of risk mitigation strategies and technologies should be addressed and are really essential to ensure the safety of these astronauts. So next, I'll be giving a little of, bit of historic context around women's involvement in spaceflight. 
So um, in 1963, Valentina Tereshkova uh, became the first woman to go to space. So after this, no woman went to space for almost 20 years. So there was a significant gap there. The USSR had sent Svet Svetlana Savitskaya uh, to space in 1982. And then this was followed by the US sending the first American woman to space. And this was Sally Ride in 1983. So as you can see, there weren't a lot of uh, female astronauts going to space within this time, as well as they were uh, spaced apart. So this alone created a major data gap in understanding the effects space has on women. And for example, if we look at the Apollo uh, era with the lunar missions, all of the Apollo astronauts were men. Subsequently, women have been sent regularly to space, but the numbers are still not close enough to fill the major gaps in understanding of female health and the relationship it has with space. So now if we jump to the early 2000s, uh, major space agencies are starting to really work on understanding the impact sex has on adaptation to space. So in 2002, NASA and the University of Missouri had a workshop to identify research priorities related to sex-based differences in adaptation to space. So they examined available data and they created recommendations to fill existing knowledge gaps on this topic. Then if we jump to 2011, um, a report published by the National Academy of Sciences in the Life Sciences of Space Exploration uh, uh, voiced the need to thoroughly understand sex disparities. And then as a result, NASA and the National Space Biomedical Research Institute commissioned research in 2013 and put out six papers on the effects of sex and gender in adaptation in space. So I gave this bit of historical background just so you get an idea of even when we just started space flight and just started the industry in the late 50s and early 60s, um, considering sex and gender and how that implements space flight and how that deals with uh, astronauts health was considered a bit later in the industry. So next I'll be going over uh, risks that are observed to be higher in female astronauts in comparison to their male counterparts. I'll be going over a few different uh, body systems, the first being the musculoskeletal system. So um, women uh, tend to have lower muscle density and more reproductive tissues in comparison to their male counterparts. And this results in them being at a higher risk for radiation damage. So in space flight, this has led to fewer missions and shorter duration missions for female astronauts, which does put them at a disadvantage. So also, um, these differences between male and female astronauts are not only important important when considering their health and safety, but also when considering the uh, opportunities they get in the field. Uh, secondly, in the uh, immune system, spaceflight is known to alter immune response. So female astronauts uh, tend to show a stronger immune response compared to their male counterparts. So this ends up manifesting a higher rate of autoimmune diseases in the female astronauts. Um, next, when we look at the neurosensory system, so female astronauts are much more sensitive to stimuli such as touch, pressure, and temperature. So female astronauts uh, have reported motion sickness more frequently than their male counterparts. And this has been motion sickness both when they initially enter space as well as when they're re-entering Earth after completing spaceflight. And then when looking at the cardiovascular system uh, through prolonged bed rest studies, so these studies simulated microgravity, uh, female astronauts have shown higher risks of post post-flight orthostatic intolerance. So Shauna had also touched on this in um, her uh, lectures, and this is um, the inability to stand for extended periods of time without fainting. So this is obviously another health concern worth uh, researching and looking more into. And then finally, with the morphology and anthropometry systems, so female astronauts are at a higher risk when spacesuits and life support systems are designed for male models. So since the initial astronauts were um, all male astronauts, astronauts, these systems have continuously been designed for their male models, models so they aren't specifically customized for these female astronauts. So women on average have shorter stature and airways, smaller lungs, and hence less lung diffusion capacity. So this is not always the case with every female astronaut, but this is just, uh, they tend to have um, these qualities. And then so NASA, for example, um, one instance where this issue kind of came to light was that NASA's initial all-female spacewalk was originally scheduled to take part place March 2019, but it had to be canceled because they did not have 
to uh, space suits that would appropriately fit the female astronauts. So the all-female spacewalk was carried out in October of that year, but I think that's an important uh, piece to note the, how the lack of proper technology for female astronauts can cause unexpected delays with uh, the research and exploration happening. So this is just another uh, quick image to show uh, you can see the difference in like posture and proportions between uh, males and females and how this can uh, eventually f affect how they fit in their spacesuits. So next I'll be looking at how AI and technology potentially can be used to address these risks. So when looking at the musculoskeletal system, uh, just to recap, the risk we'll be addressing is that lower mu muscle density and more reproductive tissues put female astronauts at a higher risk of radiation damage. So then wearable radiation shielding is not an entirely new concept. It has been designed for first responders and military members, but then looking at the future, this can, technology can be adapted to be suited for space flight. So a radiation shielding vest would provide mobility. Um, it would provide more mobility than spacesuits would, uh, which are primarily worn during spacewalks, but not during day-to-day -day life within space architecture, for example, in the International Space Station. So the radiation shielding vest would provide astronauts with pr this protected mobility when they're traveling between different elements within the architecture. So this design would so also protect the most susceptible vital organs, including bone marrow, reproductive organs, and lungs from the effects of radiation. Um, also, I am noticing we're nearing the end of class. So also if anybody needs to head out, like that's completely okay. If you have somewhere else to run to, um, that's all good. And then, so uh, next one, considering the health of female astronauts who have more reproductive tissues compared to their male astronauts, this would further protect them. Additionally, wearable vests take up minimal space. So this is important since efficient use of mass and space is critical for long duration human flight missions. And then uh, additionally, artificial intelligence can be used to help astronauts detect radiation peaks. If artificial intelligence sensors are put on future space architecture and vehicles, this can allow space organizations, whether public or private, to schedule astronaut activities around these radiation peaks. Therefore, this would protect the astronauts from unnecessary exposure to radiation and then further protect their health. So next one, looking at the immune system, uh, the issue I'll be addressing is that the female astronauts show stronger immune responses compared to their male astronaut counterparts and therefore manifest a higher rate of autoimmune diseases. So a bed rest study that simulated microgravity conducted by NASA was carried out to investigate the effect exercise and nutrition will have on immunological responses in female astronauts. Um, th these findings did show that specialized exercise routines increase immune response considerably. So then when considering how AI and technology can play a factor in this, I think specifically we can draw our attention to immersive technology. So this can directly be implemented to help improve uh, exercise programs for astronauts. For example, virtual reality can be utilized for astronaut workout programs and might incentivize them to uh, want to work out even more. So for example, putting astronauts in settings such as outdoor hikes or yoga studios would make exercise much more appealing, especially if they're slightly isolated from Earth. And this might also help combat feelings of isolation. So I just have a video. I just want to show a few quick seconds of what this uh, VR might look like. So in this video here, you can just see that this VR can look like um, going through a hike in the woods, which would be more appealing for astronauts who currently aren't home to rather than like walking on a treadmill or lifting weights. So um, additionally, when looking at the immune system, um, uh, this can be advanced to be put in like live real time where astronauts could potentially partake in exercise alongside family members or friends who are here on earth. So to my knowledge, this isn't technology that exists currently, but it would be something that might be interested to see develop in the future because this could help them combat feelings of isolation and uh, encourage them to partake in exercise and make the exercise experience more enjoyable for them. So next one, looking at the neurosensory system, um, the issue that we were looking at is female astronauts reported motion sickness more frequently than their male counterparts. 
So exercise programs were also suggested as a countermeasure for motion sickness experienced by female astronauts. But since we already touched on um, how that could be improved with AI and technology, I'm gonna be focusing more on medical and pharmaceutical countermeasures. So these have been recommended to combat motion sickness and our artificial intelligence can be implemented as a pharmaceutical tool in space flight. So in-person consultations with a pharmacist would not be accessible to astronauts when they are in space unless one of the astronauts is a pharmacist. So um, an automated pharmaceutical system could improve uh, astronauts' experience in pharmaceutical care. So this could look, for example, like um, a technology for organizing medicine, counting out medication, and filling prescriptions when necessary. I think this would further allow um, uh, improved pharmaceutical care for astronauts in space when they just don't have access to the pharmacists we do at home. And then when looking at cardiovascular system, uh, the issue we were looking at was addressing female astronauts showing a higher risk of post-flight orthostatic intolerance. So um, to combat this uh, higher risk, the um, to combat this higher risk, uh, technology simulated artificial intelligence could be utilized. So this is not in exactly a new technology, but the thing that researchers are currently working on is finding the ideal combination of artificial gravity magnitude, frequency, and duration needed to prevent cardiovascular decontamination deconditioning. So they're still working on what the right combination of these factors is, but working on this could allow female astronauts to be phased into Earth's gravity when they return to spaceflight. And if this is done gradually over a number of days, this could reduce the effects of orthostatic intolerance. And then lastly, when looking at morphology and anthropometry systems, uh, to counter the risks posed by ill-fitting spacesuits, significant advances in sp spacesuit design need to be made. So um, the first thing that came to mind for me was customizable designs. So this would enable um, any astronaut, regardless of their sex or any other uh, physical characteristics, to wear uh, well-fitted spacesuits to maximize their performance and reduce any related hazards. So this could include, for example, optional pads they could uh, implement into their spacesuits, as well as belts, et cetera, where it could just be a more customizable design to make sure that it fits all the astronauts properly. And then, so that's my presentation um, for today. I just looked at how female astronauts are uniquely affected by spaceflight and then how technology and AI could hypothetically be implemented to address the medical issues they face. I also wanted to also quickly mention Dr. Pandya who served as my mentor for my presentation. And then those are all the works that I cited. And then um, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I'll stop sharing here. So, you know, the, this uh, presentation was kind of uh, uh, historic. You did something no one has ever done in the, in the 11 year history of the course, which was, you know, the, the course uh, teaching period specifically ends at 320 and at 319. <laughs> You sort of told people if they have to leave in the in the next minute, that that's fine and so on. And it shows a kind of self-assurance of being on top of things. Very often when students are you know, presenting, they seem completely overwhelmed, like they can't handle anything else. And that was like an extra detail. It was so cool. I also feel that if somebody watches Shauna's lecture and then watches the presentation you've just given, they sort of very well complement each other, you know? And like you were talking about aspects of being female that she didn't actually mention some of them. So so it's so it's really cool from that point of view. And it's a little bit like Simon Wu um, sort of made another kind of history in the course. Um, he gave a presentation when, when he was taking the course about the quantum aspects of sight and smell that actually went beyond what the lecturer was, was talking about at that time. <laughs> and so the lecturer, Jack, Tosinski actually added Simon's topics to his subsequent lectures. 
So <laughs> sorry for for getting so so excited about this, but you know, there's a certain sameness when you've taught a course for you know eleven years, and even though the the uh, teaching sessions are very different every term, and it's really really exciting to see something brand new <laughs> happen like this. Yeah. So. So anyway, yeah, any other questions? Uh, I see that uh, Nimna Mendes has joined us. Do you have any questions <clears throat> or comments? <laughs> anyway, trying to get more interaction going here. So it's not just me talking. Yeah. Or anyone else? So we, we have four more presentations next time on Thursday. I, I think they'll be of similar quality to today. They include a grade 11 high school student from uh, Calgary. It's kind of stealth, right? I, I don't think you've ever met him on Zoom. His, his name is Michael Liu, but he will be presenting on Thursday. And that also breaks new ground. We haven't ever had a presentation from somebody that young in the course. And uh, uh, Kashika S from India, uh, she's been taking the course, but um, she, she didn't feel that she could give a presentation this term, but next term in fall, <laughs> Uh, 2022, we'll have a 15 year old giving a presentation. How about that, eh? So, any other comments? Very interesting topic. Great job, Ryan says. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and we'll see you here on Thursday. I also wanted to mention that you all performed well on the midterm. Some years, the range of grades in the midterm is like amazing from like 20 to 97. And we're not seeing that this time. So you, you guys are sort of clustered closer together. So the lowest student is closer to the highest student, which is, which is a very uh, uh, healthy thing. Um, we have coped with those remarkably low scores in the past, but it doesn't look like we, we, we have that to cope with this time. So anyway, congratulations to all, all of you for, for your good performance on, on the midterm. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you very much.